Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. If this is your very first time here, consider subscribing if you enjoy listening to horror stories and leave a like on today's video to show your support. Thank you. Let's begin. It feels like I'm sitting at the edge of a metaphorical cliff and I had no idea whether I should leap into the abyss or slowly back away. If someone had told me five years ago that I'd be here, spilling my heart out onto these pages after stepping into the world of dating again following my divorce, I would have laughed loudly and mockingly. But here I am, and it's not, well, I'm not sure how to make any sense of it all. Let's just say that. My name is Anthony. I'm 45 years old, navigating this chaotic afterlife of a broken marriage that ended in 2015. My ex-wife Laura and I, we had our ups and downs, but somehow we managed to come out the other end. After Derek was born, I thought that life would settle into more predictable rhythm, just a normal family life. But as the years went on, our distance became too vast to ignore, separating us in ways I couldn't comprehend until the very end. Derek, my son, is now 18 years old. I remember holding him for the first time, as if it were just yesterday. Over the years, I've tried my best to be a good father. Of course, he's been through so much with the divorce. Some nights, I see him staring out of his window, lost in thought. There's a look of rebellion in him, but mostly, I think he just wants to figure himself out. I get that. After all, I'm still figuring myself out too, many decades older. After Laura, dating felt like stepping into another world altogether. Tinder became my go-to app, and I had no idea what I was doing after spending over 20 years with one person. I was no longer the fresh-faced kid I was when I first met Laura. I'd encountered life, love, and loss, and the resulting emotional baggage was damn heavy. Still, I swiped right and left, anything to fill the rush of connection, but I didn't realise the journey would lead me to an absolute sick woman called Cindy. <sighs> oh, Cindy. So, we matched one Friday night. She seemed all warm and kind, and even flirtatious. Quote, let's grab a drink, she said. It felt natural, and for the first time in years, I found myself excited. Our conversations were going well. They were a mixture of light-hearted jokes, deeper conversations, and history of our family. Our first date, she revealed her love for art her spirit for following football, and a bunch of other stuff that I couldn't remember, because why would I, after what she did. After a couple of casual meetups at our local pubs, I thought about how different my life could be with her beside me. Cindy was slightly younger, 37, vivacious, and possessed by a sense of adventure I hadn't seen in ages. She took me to galleries I'd never seen, and introduced me to food I'd never tried. Every moment with her felt exhilarating, as if I'd shed a heavy coat and stepped into sunlight after a long frost. But it wasn't just the good that kept us together. It was also the thrill of initial attraction and connection, and, inevitably, the flaws that began to reveal themselves. One could only ignore the cracks in her rhythm for so long. By the time we reached our third date, the inevitable crescendo of reality began to settle upon us, giving way to misunderstandings and criticisms that didn't sit well in my stomach. What struck me most was the way that Cindy could easily switch between light-hearted jokes and absolute seriousness, as if she had bipolar, one evening, while sharing a pint, a light comment I made about her taste in music 
spiralled into a nightmare of defensiveness arguments. What had begun as just a trivial joke turned into an escalating argument as if the very foundation of our connection was crumbling before my eyes. She accused me of being dismissive while I felt she was too sensitive. What had been wonderful about her, the passion, the fire, turned into a flame that I couldn't nourish anymore. The date ended in tension, the silence in the car heavier than the laughter we had shared at the beginning of the night. You see, my gut told me it wasn't going to last, that maybe this wasn't meant to be, and I found myself spiralling into a longing for, well, my ex-wife. We parted ways and I anticipated an apology or reconciliation for a few days. I was a hopeful romantic, even at my age, but no, as each day dragged by, my heart began to harden a little more. Then came the bombshell. Cindy ran into Derek, my son, at some local event, a college gathering that he attended with friends. I can still remember the disbelief that I felt as he casually mentioned how he had ended up hanging out with her because she asked to chill. Quote, you know Cindy? Yeah, I think she's pretty cool, he said, backpedaling with a bunch of jokes, trying to brush it off lightheartedly. I can't remember much else from that day, or much else that he even said, only that it sparked a dark blip of anger and confusion within me. I suddenly realised that they could spend time together, and a feeling of betrayal came over me. She was supposed to have been mine. Now, she was messing with my 18-year-old son, and he seemed perfectly fine with it. My head was spinning as I sat down and spoke to my son Derek to see if they were dating. With innocent confidence, he declared, no, Dad, we're just having fun. Fun. Those two syllables ignited a whirlwind of images in my brain. Her body, how she used to look, and how she was insane in bed. I could feel hot anger within me. This was disgusting, and the fact she had even found out where Derek was going was the weird part. I don't even want to go into any more details. All you guys need to know is that I confronted her. After days and days of simmering anger and resentment, I'll be honest, I couldn't take it any longer. It was a clumsy argument littered with accusations on my part and a defensive whirlwind of hers led to another undercurrent of frustrations. How could you? The words bubbled from my lips, and I could see pain flash across her face. You're ridiculous, she said. Why is this any of your business? We're both adults. Maybe you should focus on your relationship with your son instead of sulking over a failed fling. As she turned the words back at me, it struck me with the depth of a thousand scales tipping. I felt justified anger, but also embarrassment, and that's when she dropped the greatest shock of all. You think I'm getting back at you? She spat. You're not that important to me. I'm just having a good time with Derek, but maybe you should focus on dude's night out instead of brooding over your pathetic life. In that moment, I felt crushed. I wanted to grab her, and throw her across the room. The finale of our brief tryst was in my heart. Derek, my son, my baby, how could he even think about getting involved with her? This had just made the situation even worse, and if anything, had ruined my relationship with my son. The thought was twisted, sickening, and disgusting. That was the last ever time I spoke to Cindy, and the last time I saw her. It felt awful. Hours passed by, 
They turned into years, as I processed what she had said. I felt guilty, betrayed by her, but more importantly my own son. This made me feel like an imposter in my own skin, as I no, had, no longer had control over anything. The days rolled on, growing quieter and darker. I found myself being more and more reclused. I had no friends. I refused to go out with those I did. And I just drank. I drank my problems away. A fractured relationship with not only my ex-wife, not only Cindy, but now Derek. He had gone and slept with her, and he was loving every second of it. She had taken his virginity, and I was supposed to stand there like a clown, as if I was somehow the middle man. Part of me wanted to kick Derek out. I wanted to lay my bare feelings and shout, How the hell could you? But the other part, the softer, protective side of me, realized that he was just a teenager with hormones. Cindy, who's a good-looking woman, and has a promiscuous nature, can definitely dress up with some fitting clothes to fit perfectly on her curves, to then somehow convince Derek to sleep with her. I don't even want to think about it, and no doubt people want to hear more details of what Derek said, but I will not, more capitals, be going into anything of such nature. Cindy is no longer in my life, Derek still lives with me, but we barely ever talk anymore. I don't know if he talks to her or sees her, it's none of my business anymore, but I do think what he did was wrong, because he knew that I was dating her. I'm disappointed in him, and I'm disgusted with Cindy, a woman in her late thirties, who was with an eighteen-year-old, pretty questionable, sure, blurt it from the rooftops about how legal it is, but it's not moral, and I'll never stand by the fact that it is. Take care of yourself, don't put yourself out there unless you're ready to get hurt, and that applies for both the men and the women. Listen, my story is in the case of a nasty woman, but there are plenty, if not way more, nasty men out there to make the ratio balanced. I feel that you just can't date anymore, there's no such thing as true love, and it's almost impossible to find. Good luck, because you'll need it. Today was supposed to be the day where everything changed. I've been talking to Jake for a few weeks now, an older guy I met in a veterans forum online. He's a few decades ahead of me, and I was intrigued by the stories he told me of his time serving overseas. He's filled with wisdom and a hint of nostalgia. He made me laugh. On our video calls, He'd lean into the screen, looking at me as if I was a ghost. It was funny, but the stories he told, yeah, they were good. When he suggested that we meet in person for drinks at a local veterans bar, I was a mix of excited and nervous. This was concrete, real life, not just exchanging messages behind a screen. I tried to ignore my anxiety, focusing on Stead, of actually going. Would he find me attractive? Would we have that same chemistry in person? I decided to get myself ready and agree to meeting him there. I figured, hey, what's the worst that could happen? We fall out and I just leave. It's no big deal. We both drive and we can just part ways. The bar itself was small, way smaller than I thought it would be. But considering it was a veteran's bar, I guess, well, that could be normal. I arrived at the bar a little early. I was very nervous, and the place was pretty full. It absolutely stunk of fried food, 
which isn't necessarily a bad thing, as I'm a huge foodie, the bar was full of memorabilia from various conflicts, felt like a homage to the past, a place where stories were shared and friendships were forged over pints. I sat at the bar ordering a ginger ale while I waited, trying to calm my nerves by focusing on my surroundings. I did not fit in here. Being in my late thirties, I seriously looked way too young. Time ticked by slowly, each minute stretched out. My thoughts were buzzing in my head. What if he didn't show? How would I walk out of here looking normal? But what if we didn't connect? Just as I began to lose hope, the door swung open, and there he was, Jake, pretty imposing guy with a huge smile. He wasn't exactly how I'd imagined him, and for some reason he looked a bit more different than on the video calls, which aren't accurate at all. He had silver hair, a full head of silver hair, and I couldn't help but smile back as he approached me and gave me a warm smile. Good evening, young lady he said with a deep voice. Hi, I replied, trying to sound not nervous. We started talking. The first few minutes were awkward pleasantries, and quickly settling into our conversation, the initial nervousness evaporated as we started sharing jokes and stories. His laughter was contagious, and I found myself relaxing more with each passing moment. Just as we were really hitting our stride, I noticed an older woman enter the bar with him. Older being 90 plus, this woman was with a stroller, and she came straight over and stared directly at him, which is why I knew that she was with him. She was small, frail, but her presence, it was rude as hell. She held on to Jake's arm, and I could see the family bond. Ah, meet my grandma, Edna, Jake said, a proud smile on his face. She's my plus one for the night. At that moment, I didn't really know how to react. He clearly didn't take me very seriously, as why else would he bring his 90-something-year-old grandma to the date? I didn't expect this. I put on a fake smile for Edna, as she sat down next to him, staring at me weirdly. So, you're the girl my grandson's been talking about, she said, looking me up and down with scepticism. Uh, yes, it's nice to meet you, I managed to reply, forcing a smile that felt increasingly strained. She took her glasses off and squinted at me, a judgmental look in her eyes. You're a bit young for him, aren't you? How old are you? Twenty? Twenty-one? No, thirty-five, I said, trying to maintain my composure. Right, well, you look like his little sister. I felt my cheeks flush. I was embarrassed as heck. Did she mean that as an insult? I was too stunned to respond, and Jake, Sensing the awkwardness, quickly intervened. Be nice. Come on, she's a great gal. But Edna seemed unfazed. She turned back to me, her eyes raking over my face as if searching for flaws. You do realise that beauty isn't everything. It's what's inside that counts. And I'm th hoping you have something worthwhile in there, she said. I felt my heart drop into my stomach. Jake's face changed, he looked like he couldn't believe what she was doing. Even he was clearly uncomfortable. I suddenly felt very small, and painfully aware of every blemish and insecurity I'd ever had. Uh, thanks, I said. She waved a hand dismissively. I hope you're not planning on getting any work done. Ridiculous thing to do to yourself. You should just be happy with what you have. Tears threatened to spill over as I tried to hold on to my composure, but her words felt like knives, each one stabbing into my body. I could feel the heat rising in my cheeks 
and a lump forming in my throat as I fought back the tide of emotion. Edna, Jack started, Jake started. His voice was strained. I could see the tension in his shoulders and how he wanted to defuse the situation, and I appreciated it, but I kind of knew it was too late. I think, uh, I need to go, I said softly. Jake frowned. What? No, come on. Stay, let's have some drinks. No, I interrupted. I really need to go. I slid off the bar stool and took a step back, feeling dizzy. Part of me hoped that Jake would reach out and would say something to stop me. But he stood there, a conflicting look on his face, as I turned and left the bar. The cool evening air hit me as I stepped outside. This was the most humiliating, gut-wrenching date experience I'd ever had, and I felt a mix of anger, embarrassment, and disappointment. I walked towards my car, getting my keys out, hardly able to see through my tears. A 90-year-old woman had me on the brink of a mental breakdown. All I could think about were Edna's words. Each one was echoing in my mind. You look a little younger. Ridiculous thing to do to yourself. You should just be happy with what you have. It felt like a bad dream, a moment I wanted to erase. Being accused of plastic surgery by a 90-year-old, when I've never even done so much as put a single bit of filler in my face. I didn't just feel ugly. I felt broken broken and humiliated. The drive home was awful. I could taste the salt in my tears. Disappointment, anger, sadness. How many more emotions could I tick off that I experienced that night? Why oh why had Jake brought her? I wished he had warned me, given me a heads up. It felt unfair. For someone who could make me laugh and feel at ease. How was he tethered to someone who could be so cruel? When I got home, I collapsed into my bed, still in my clothes, the darkness around me consuming my thoughts. I turned onto my back and stared up at the ceiling. The shadows were just consuming the whole room. Was it wrong? Was it wrong that I left? What was wrong with me? I could hear my thoughts in my own mind. You're ugly. You'll never find anyone who loves you. What's the point? Somewhere between tears I picked up my phone, tempted to reach out to Jake, to tell him how his grandma had ruined everything. Wait, let me rephrase that. To tell him how his rude grandma had ruined everything. But I waited. My fingers were hovering over the screen. I was hesitant. What would I say? Hey, your grandma is a monster, and I'm falling apart over here. I couldn't bear the idea of sounding childish or insecure, or taking a dig at him. Instead, I threw the phone aside, burying my face in my pillow, as I let the tears consume me. It felt as if everything I'd hoped for in that connection was slipping through my fingers like sand, and all I wanted to do all I wished I could do was heal it. The reality is, I couldn't, and although I tried, it wasn't even worth it. On any given day, I might have been caught up in boring tasks, work, emails, groceries, living life in the boring yet comforting rhythm of our normal routines. I have no idea how quickly things could pivot from the ordinary to the extraordinary just like that. In hindsight, I should have listened to my instincts last Friday, 
Yeah. Sonia was a girl I matched with on Tinder. It was almost too good to be true. She was almost everything I wanted. Gorgeous, fun-loving, and exuding a magnetic energy. Let's grab a drink sometime, she suggested. Oh, not to mention that this girl was confident in a good way. One way that didn't come across as patronising, or like someone that just doesn't respect men. I'd always been more of an introverted guy. I didn't like to pursue connections off a screen. Sanya had disrupted my routine, with a persistent wave of message after message. Something just told me to roll with it. We arranged a date at a local bar. The atmosphere was relaxed, and I decided that I was going to meet her. The moment I laid eyes on her sitting at the back with her thick long hair, I felt a rush of adrenaline. Immediately, all the lines and words I'd practiced that morning left my lips and my brain, and I stood there like an idiot, holding my own tongue like I had a stammer condition. She came over to me, gave me a hug and started talking. I approached her, and I felt the sense of anxiety and unknown. Perhaps it was bad judgement to feel this way right off the bat, but I couldn't exactly help it. It was just my brain chemistry. We stayed there for around three hours, our drinks long forgotten, and her laugh ringing in my ears. It wasn't until she leaned closer to me that I could feel a connection deepening between us. I have a place, a really cool spot I want to show you, she whispered to me, her breath warm against my skin. What was this place? Well, keep reading. Sure, where? I replied. It's a house, kind of a getaway, she explained. Just a few friends hanging out, nothing too crazy. You'll love it. For a moment, I sat and thought about it. What the hell was this girl trying to do? Was this an invitation to go home and sleep with her? Or was this an invitation to go and party at some weird alt house party? I didn't want to be the buzzkill who refused to take risks. Plus, how could I pass up on a chance to sleep with this girl? We exchanged numbers and arranged for me to meet her the following evening, saying that I wouldn't go that night, but I could have gone the next day. Fast forward to Saturday night. The weather had changed. It was bad. Damn bad. I drove to the address that Sanya had texted me. I replayed every detail of our conversation in my mind, how relaxed and genuine she came across, yet still preserved that air of mystery. Perhaps what excited me most was not just Sanya, but the unpredictable thrill of chasing after something unknown. The house was isolated, tucked away at the end of a winding lane with trees either side. My instincts told me this wasn't a great idea, this didn't exactly feel like a typical party destination. I parked my car up next to some others and walked over with my feet crunching under the gravel. I knocked on the door. A brief moment passed and finally, Sanya answered. Her face looks excited as she swung the door wide open. You made it, she said. I stepped into what felt like a different world. There were glowing orange lights on the walls. I hadn't seen these in my entire life. They looked weird and otherworldly. A group had gathered in the living room, laughing, drinks in their hands and music playing out of some speakers by the television. The atmosphere was lively, and I could feel it, until I noticed the glances from some of the other guys in the room. All of a sudden, the initial excitement twisted and I started to feel a bit uncomfortable. Who were these guys and why were they there? There were girls too, but more guys than girls. Sanya guided me through to the other people. A tall guy with tattooed arms slapped me on the back, pouring me a drink and welcoming me to the gang. We're just here to have fun, he grinned though something about the way he looked at me sent me feeling pretty uncomfortable. 
Just a bunch of good friends hanging out, Sanya said. Her voice light, but her gaze darted around suspiciously, as if something was about to happen. I couldn't get rid of the feeling that something was totally off. I felt sick, anxious, and very uncomfortable. I was seriously considering mustering up excuses to leave that place. She's fantastic, the guy said, his eyes staring at her cleavage. You definitely lucked out, bro. As the night went on, I tried my best to blend in, but as I settled into the rhythm of this group, a few lines of their conversation raised red flags. You know how we deal with guys who get in our way? A lot of people don't leave the game as easily as they think, one of them said. What was this guy on about? Well, some kind of game. I didn't want to play it, and I didn't know why I was still there. Sanya became pretty much a memory in my mind, as she left me all alone for a couple hours. I had nagging thoughts. Part of me was still scared. I glanced at my phone and realized it was getting late. Hey Sanya, I said, looking for an out. I should probably head back. She stepped closer. Stay a little longer, she said. I promise it gets better. Before I could respond, she pulled me deeper into the house, leading me away from the living room and starting to pull me onto some kind of platform in a spare room. The platform leads up into a bunk bed Kind of like a set of wooden steps that lead up into a second room upstairs, but there's no wall that separates it. Once we got up there, she says, want to play a game? Sure, what kind? I said, thinking that she was about to strip off and start making love violently to me. Truth or dare, she declared. I dare you to give me your phone. I laughed at the absurdity of the dare but I could see something change in her. My phone? Seriously? Yeah, let's see what you're hiding, she said. I hesitated. The feeling of rightness drifted further out of reach. What could she possibly do? I thought that this girl was harmless. Sanya, five foot six. This girl could do nothing. But I was worried about the other guys. They were the guys that really scared me. I didn't know any of them, but in that moment, I thought she was going to take my phone just to look through Tinder or to search through my texting to see if I was talking to any other girls. Instead, once I hand her the phone, she doesn't even look at it. She takes it and puts it in some weird safe connected to the wall right by the bunker area where we're up. Bunker being code word for bunk bed. There was no bed there, it was just a wooden flooring platform, with a bunch of ladder slash stairs leading up to it. The second she did this, I looked at her funny, and I said, Hey, why are you putting it in there? Please can I have it back? She doesn't say anything. In fact, after she puts it away and locks the door, she acts like I'm genuinely not there, as if I'm a ghost. She crawls past me and gets over to the stairs, steps her way down, opens a door and leaves the room. So much for the imaginary lovemaking I had store. I understand now why she did that, because what I witnessed next was something I probably would have recorded had I have had my phone. When I get down the stairs and get my way out of the room, I led back down into the living room by my own memory because Sanya's nowhere to be seen. Whilst I'm on my way down to the living room, near the open kitchen, I start to hear noises of moaning and lovemaking. I turn the corner, and I'm met with the sight of everybody, no clothes on, wearing weird animal masks, with the tall strong tattooed men, in positions of, how do I say this, submission. Their legs were open, and the women were just having a go. It was disgusting, and I could understand why she didn't want me having my phone, and tried everything she could to stop me from having it. I stood there clueless while another girl came up to me, tried to take my clothes off, 
and convinced me to let her F me with a weird toy around her waist. I said no thank you and tried to make my way out of the property, which turned out to be harder than I expected. One, my phone was still locked in the safe. Two, I knew that all the doors were now locked. I went round to every window and door, there were no keys in sight, and all the guys who I thought could help me were in the middle of being, well, taken care of, in a way that they seemed to enjoy. I kept walking around until finally I made it to a room which seemed to be empty. There was a tiny window open in the room, which was just about big enough for me to squeeze my whole body through if I opened it fully. I forced the window latch more, so bending it at the frame, meaning that it opened to an unnatural degree. This meant that I had more chance of actually fitting through it. Finally, after getting most of my upper torso out, I managed to pull myself using my arms against the lower part of the window. It was painful, very painful, and part of the frame dug into my body, except I finally managed to get out. The good thing is Sanya didn't take my keys, so when I made it out I could drive away, report everything to the police, and get my phone back. The police didn't really care about the parties and what they did in them, they just cared that she stole the phone. She gave no reason for stealing the phone, even though I know exactly why. The police tried to ask me more details on what I saw and witnessed that evening, but for the sake of those people and their professions, I decided to just say no comment. I boast everything off of the theft of the phone, which was wrong, but I understand why she did it. In there were apparently lawyers, different high level people, and teachers, people who would instantly lose their jobs if I'd got footage of them taking part in something like that. Truly weird, truly perverted. Hey guys, thank you for staying tuned until the end of tonight's stories. If you're new here and you enjoy listening to horror stories, please click subscribe down below to join us. Here on this channel I upload every single day, so if you enjoy listening to new stories that have never been posted anywhere else on YouTube, then make sure to hit that subscribe and click the grey bell next to it. There are three ways you can support this channel. Number one is subscribe. You can only do this once. Number two is liking the video by giving it a thumbs up. Number three is commenting down below your opinions on the stories or interacting with them. If you want to just give a word of support, that's also welcome. Thank you everyone, I hope you're well, and I'll catch you tomorrow.